There was some concern that Nokia was a little bit behind the curve. There were some issues that caused some delays, and perhaps versus the other two key players, Huawei and Ericsson, that you weren't as quick to deploy 5G. Is that now in the past? Yes, it is, because we, we said that, you know, we have a few weeks of, of delays. In the context of a 15, 20-year 5G cycle, that's not really much. And so when it comes, therefore, to the customers you're announcing, 42, I think, is the latest. Yes, yeah. Are these customers deploying 5G right here, right now? Are you able to book revenue right here, right now? These are customers that are deploying right here, right now, indeed. Uh, 42 around the world. And uh, we, we expect to start recognizing revenue soon. Yeah. And talk to us about where the opportunities lie. It's not only, of course, in public networks. It's not only the consumer who's going to be using 5G, yeah. much faster speeds when you're talking to people or using video, but notably it's industrial use cases, autos, energy companies. How much are you seeing a demand from private networks to be built? What sort of future is that? Significant, because we see the big opportunities in manufacturing, in logistics, supply chains, utilities, uh, mining, all kinds of energy companies water, uh, wind farms, you name it, so transportation. Uh, so I think industrial IoT on the basis of private campus networks will be fairly significant. And from a geographical perspective, we're sat here in the UK announcing, clearly seeing a new UK customer bringing it forward. But where in geographical terms are you seeing 5G grabbing the most attention and people signing the most contracts? US, Korea, Japan, Europe. Okay, so in that sort of lineup and yep. what's interesting about the supplier base is well it's very consolidated when you look at the players it's yourself it's Huawei and it's Ericsson yeah now in terms of a three-horse race Huawei is almost a once in a generation moment where Ericsson and Nokia can start to reclaim back some of that market share taken by the Chinese are you seeing that we already know you've won TDC you've already won SoftBank will there be more well we, we compete quite favorably with Huawei with or without the current security concerns, right? Mm. We've, we've uh, taken some 23 contracts with them in radio in just the last two years. You know, we've, we've, we win two thirds of the time against our Nordic competitor uh, compared to one third of the time that they uh, swap us out. So we win quite handsomely. Our strength is that we have the end-to-end -end portfolio and we can provide this at scale in every geography of the world, bar none. Plus, we have a strong enterprise channel purpose-built for industrial IoT, and we've got like a 1,000 enterprise customers growing at about 150, 200 every year. So how price-elastic or inelastic, therefore, are your client base? Because many have felt that Huawei took so much market share because they were cheaper. Mm -hmm. Is that something you've been forced to do and look at compressing your margins, looking at offering cheaper elements, or is it that people need the full end-to-end, -end, as you say? End-to-end -end is a big strength of ours. I mean, we've, we had something like 35% of our pipeline a year ago was end-to-end, -end, now it's about 49%. Our order intake is strong on end-to-end. -end. Uh, the 42 commercial 5G deals we talked about, half of them have components that are beyond just 5G radio. So end-to-end -end is going to be way more important in 5G than it has been in 4G. And when we talk about industrial IoT, these enterprise customers actually buy systems. Mm. They want a smart grid modernization solution. They don't care you know, whether it's going to be routing from some other player or optics from some other and then radio from you, they want to buy the system. The RFQ is a complete RFQ. So when it gets to the enterprise, the end-to-end -end is a no-brainer. In the uh, service provider space, it's increasingly becoming a relevant strategic uh, decision point. What's also a strategic decision point is whether you have Huawei in any way integrated in your system as a country, as a, as a telecoms provider. Is the issues we're seeing, whether it might be the U.S.-China trade war or specifically the blacklisting of Huawei, the targeting of Huawei, is that a net positive or a, net, or a negative for your business? I think it's early to call it anyway. Uh, I'd just say that, yes, there's some uncertainty uh, and some unpredictability as to how this will unfold. What we have done is, on our part, we've been very thoughtful about if you are a customer that wants to swap out your existing 4G player, how are you going to deal with it? You know, and we've come up with four alternatives whereby you don't have to delay your rollout. Uh, ah. and, and so we're focused on just being there for our customers when they need us, security concerns or not. So the arguments made by perhaps German player Deutsche Telekom that they're already in bed with Huawei and it would delay, delay their rollout of 5G, you think is not correct? I don't think on a European level that 
there will be any delays based on this situation with regard to security concerns. Uh, I think, if any, there might be delays on the count of you know spectrum not being available or, or you know, the economics make, not making sense for a particular operator. But we have four technical solutions should you want to swap out your existing base. Uh, and you know they're all doable. They all have pros and cons, but they're doable. What about the cons that potentially some have paid lip service to that through the US-China trade tensions, we will see sort of two different technology focuses ending up being built, two ways of delivering 5G that will be incompatible in some way. Do you think that that's a risk in the no. way that telecoms... No. No. I don't think that's a risk, no. What is the key risk when it comes to security, when it comes to providers such as... Is, is really a relevant, realistic risk to have Huawei as a provider, do you think? Uh, the concern that people are expressing is that, you know, it's going to be critical national infrastructure, so the, the, the focus on security will be there no matter what. It has to be there. And the second is that where is the intelligence in the network? Is it in the core network? Is it at the edge? Is it throughout the network? And basically, it's going to be throughout the network because, you know, there's no one particular place where intelligence sits. And, of course, the third thing is this is going to be used for industrial networks. So hence, you get all this talk about, you know, worries around security. And I think that makes sense. You know, one has to, it is going to be critical national infrastructure. You're going to have industrial 5G networks used for a lot of industries as well as for carriers that will also use network slicing to deploy it for industrial applications. So that concern is valid. And so I think security cannot be an afterthought. You know, that's why we at Nokia focus on design for security in our products. It's a non-negotiable. It is not an afterthought. It's right at the outset. And, uh, you know, whether or not there'll be uh, concerns around this in other countries, we'll see. It's too early to tell if this is an opportunity or a risk. Uh, I can say that there's some unpredictability and uncertainty, but overall, you know, we'll be there for our customers when they need us, and we'll have multiple technology alternatives. What about those that see you as a customer? You do have suppliers in China. Is this something you're having to change? You're having to reroute your own supply chains to keep your customers then happy that you're the most secure provider out there? Fortunately, we have a global supply chain. And, you know, we're able to migrate, mitigate some of the near-term risks, whether they be trade concerns or, or security concerns and, and, and so on. So I think, yes, we have some near-term headwind uh, from, you know, cost related to the trade wars uh, and the tariffs coming into force, but none that we can't manage in the scheme of things. And none that would put your full-year targets at risk? None that would put our full-year targets at risk. And as a business leader, is it geopolitical risk? Is it trade tensions that keep you up at nine at the moment? What is the number one thing that you have to navigate and how difficult is that? I mean, fortunately, the investment in 5G is counter-cyclical, so to speak. Mm. So I think it's, even if there were a macro downturn, this, this is something that you will invest in. So we are an attractive sector no matter what, because 5G, you, you absolutely have to invest in. Countries will compete on investing in 5G. So I, I see 5G as a big cycle, a long cycle, a deeper cycle than 4G or 3G in the past, uh, peaking not before about 10 years and going to be there for 15, 20 years. And when will Nokia have the dominant market share? Nokia is winning big in 5G. 42 commercial customers, I could not, I could not have dreamed of a better start. This is a great start for Nokia in 5G.